Hi, uh, my, Please stop talking. my name is uh, Russ Lagerwall. I work for Citrix on Zen and Zen Server, and I'm going to be talking about implementing Secure Boot. Uh, there is no audio. So you need to actually keep quiet, and then you will be able to listen. The mic is only for the live streaming. So I'm going to be talking about Secure Boot on Zen. So I'll briefly go into some background about it and why it's useful. So Secure Boot is basically a way of preventing malware from running uh, at boot. So the worst, kind of the worst thing that can happen is malware sort of affects the bootloader or operating system kernel image. And once it's got to that point, it can basically own the system. I mean, this could happen from like a rogue update or something. So there are a number of ways that it could happen, but one way of preventing it is to use secure boot. So it's, the firmware basically has a way of trust, working out whether the image is trusted or not and uh, preventing you from booting untrusted images. So this works well if you've got real hardware. Um, but if you've got a VM in the cloud, for example, like running Zen, um, unfortunately it doesn't support Secure Boot at the moment. So what can we do about it? So just on some background, um, Secure Boot is actually part of the UEFI specification, um, just added in version 2.3.1. And this is basically a replacement for the BIOS, which the firmware that sort of starts the operating system and provides some services to it. So the first thing to note is that, well, if we're running, if we want to use Secure Boot, then we need to be using UEFI guests. Luckily, Zen does support UEFI guests already, so there's nothing for us to do. It makes use of OVMF, which is kind of like a build of the Tianacore uh, open source UEFI implementation uh, tailored for virtual machines. Now, the way that uh, UEFI starts the kernel or bootloader is kind of different from if you're used to BIOS. Uh, so with BIOS, it basically chooses a disk to boot and starts executing from the MBR at the beginning of the disk. Um, with UEFI, the firmware knows how to understand GPT partition tables and FAT file systems. And so it's configured to boot a particular file of a particular file system. And this is sort of quite a lot like how an operating system would start some executable that it knows about. Now, when you turn on secure boot, there's an extra step. Um, basically, before executing that file, it verifies whether the file is trusted and can be executed. So how does this work? Um, so hardware has NVRAM, which is kind of like non-volatile storage separate from the main disk. And these store UEFI variables, which are kind of like key value pairs. And some of them are contain certificates. Um, there are a number of them, and I won't go into the details of what they mean. But essentially, uh, the bootloader or kernel that you're executing needs to have been si signed by one of these so-called trusted certificates. And therefore, if the kernel is replaced with something else, um, the firmware will refuse to start it because it hasn't been signed properly. The certificate databases themselves can be populated in a number of ways. One of them, which is probably the most common, is just that the at factory install, the certificates are loaded into the NVRAM, and uh, it just works because the laptop or whatever comes preloaded with an operating system. And so if you're running Windows, it'll come with the Microsoft certificates. Um, if you want, you can update the certificates in the database. So these databases are called authenticated variables. And they require um, to update it. You make a sort of runtime call called set variable. 
but this update needs to be signed by specifically one of the um, certificates that's already in the database. And so malware can't uh, sort of trick its it can't trick itself into uh, being trusted by inserting its own certificates in the database unless it can sign the update, in which case it could sign the bootloader anyway. Um, the third way is typically there's like a platform-specific reset method. So um, on real hardware, you would say press F2 during boot and with physical access reset the certificates to or clear them. Uh, for a VM, we typically, the way I implemented it on Zen was just in the hypervisor or specifically DOM0, there'd be some uh, button that you can press or command to run and you can clear the database for a VM. Uh, so if you look at how this is implemented on real hardware, kind of the most important thing is that the code to update, that's, or the set variable code which handle and the firmware which handles um, updating those certificate databases needs to be protected from uh, being sort of interfered with because if uh, malware could interfere with this code and somehow circumvent the checks, then it would be possible to uh, just you know, insert your own certificates. Or if it could write directly to the flash, then it's a problem. So there needs to be a way of protecting um, the code that's running, but it's kind of just, you know, it runs on the same CPU that's executing uh, the, the other code, which, you know, it could be some sort of rogue device driver that's running in, as part of the operating system. So there needs to be a way of sort of defining an extra level of privilege or execution context. And on x86 processes, this already exists in the form of something called system management mode, or SMM for short. Um, so this is kind of something that you can jump into and execute code from a special section of RAM called SMRAM, which is hidden from the rest of the system. Um, so the sort of security sensitive part of the firmware is placed in that SMRAM, and the NVRAM is configured in a way that it can only be written from within SMM. So making a variable update then uh, requires doing an SMI, and then it traps into this system management mode, and in theory, it's secure, at least in theory. <laughs> um, so. KVM has implemented secure boot. Um, the, the, way, the approach that they took uh, kind of, it virtualizes what real hardware does. So QMU emulates some flash memory, um, which is the NVRAM, and KVM emulates system management mode for guests. And it kind of implements or reuses parts of the uh, Tiano Core firmware for the SMI handling and the way that it jumps into um, the sort of SMM part of the firmware. Um, so there's an interesting talk by Paolo um, about implementing this on KVM, so I won't get into too many details because I'll probably get them wrong. <laughs> um, so how should this be implemented on, then, on Zen? Um, so there are kind of lots of vulnerabilities against uh, SMM mode because it's kind of tricky the way that it's implemented. And so there are lots of ways of attacking it, you know, all sorts of cache attacks. And um, the previous talk I mentioned about uh, implementing it on KVM also details some of these attacks. Um, in addition, Zen does not have any support for emulating SMM. So implementing it would require, well, could introduce more bugs, at least until they ironed out. Uh, thirdly, the using emulated flash kind of limits the flexibility of how variables are stored because the code that writes the, writes the flash is um, stored in, 
<coughs> it's well, it's part of the firmware which runs inside the guest. So uh, this is kind of okay for regular hardware, but for VMs we want to be more flexible because you want to be able to import VMs, and export VMs, migrate them from diff to different hosts. Um, so it would be useful if you could have something that was a bit more flexible. So with virtualization, there are kind of already two distinct privilege levels or um, execution contexts, you know, broadly speaking, the guest and the hypervisor. So using SMM is well, not really needed to create this boundary or, or separation. So what we propose is to run a daemon in DOM0, which what for Zen would be DOM0, essentially part of the hypervisor, that implements the variable services outside of, um, outside of the guest itself, and then add a new module to OVMF, which implements the variable services by essentially proxying them to the daemon that's running uh, in DOM0. So there are about four or five different variable services that it does this for. Um, so this means that the guest does not have direct access to the code, so it doesn't need to make use of uh, the special SMRAM. Um, it doesn't have direct access to the storage, so there isn't anything specifically needed for the flash emulation. Um, and it means that the variable storage can easily be abstracted into different backends. So you could use uh, an SQLite database or a Zappy database or flat files, kind of whatever you need to use to get the situation done. Uh, so I'll just talk about how this works in um, a little bit more detail with an example. So uh, let's suppose that operating system wants to make a update to a um, one of the certificate databases by adding a new certificate so it would do this by calling uh, the set variable call which is a runtime service it's sort of a bit like a system call to the firmware or a sort of indirect function call and it would send the new data and sort of assigned authentication descriptor which is needs to be signed by one of the existing certificates in the database. So this goes into the proxy module uh, in OVMF which we wrote called which we called Zen variable and it finds the set variable handler there. Um, so that basically has some memory which it's set aside and it serializes the function call parameters into this uh, separate memory and then makes an IO port write um, to a well-known port number with the address of that memory. Uh, this causes the daemon in DOM0 to wake up which we called vastor-d um, and it, so, so it handles the IO port write from the guest. Um, that basically unserializes the uh, the function call that's, or it maps the memory from the guest, uh, unserializes the contents of it, and works out which command to run. In this case, it's the set variable one, so it calls the set variable function, and this then proceeds with the regular you know, behavior of set variable and um, th all the various authentication checks, and. If it's a successful call, which in this case let's say it is, then it stores it in the Zappy database, which uh, could be anywhere, for example, it could be on a, another host even. Um, once this has happened, the response is then written back into the memory mapped buffer. Um, so it would be EFI success, just a simple status code for this. Um, that returns from the IO port write, which then uh, causes the guest to continue executing. And the Zen variable module basically unserializes the, uh, unserializes the response and returns it back to the operating system. So there's kind of a clear 
separation between uh, what happens in the hypervisor and what happens in the guest, um, which makes it quite easy to analyze from a security perspective. Uh, so just to yeah, go over that, um, so we wrote a daemon called VastorD, which implements this. And at the moment, there's a single backend, which is the Zappy database, which is used on Zen server, but it's kind of written in a way that makes it easy to use other backends. And then there's a, a OVMF module called Zen variable, which implements this sort of proxy. And it's, we've got it working on Zen at the moment, and so you can sec implement secure boot and test it with both Linux and Windows guests. I believe it could be used uh, with KVM without too much difficulty due to the fact that, I mean, nothing in it is really uh, Zen specific. So this could be a, a different approach to SMM. Um, it's also not really a platform specific implementation. So SMM is kind of tied to the x86 platform as far as I understand. Um, whereas this, okay, it uses an IO port write, but that the same sort of approach could be used on uh, any platform. Um, so I've got a demo video, which I didn't want to do it live since it seemed a bit risky. But um, So what I'm going to do here is start a VM. This is running on Zen server, and it's booting up in uh, UEFR and... At the bottom right is the console log for VastorD, which is essentially logging the runtime service request that VastorD is handling on behalf of the guest. So you can see various get and set variable commands. Uh, I'm just going to check that the kernel re reports that it has been uh, booted securely. So Linux reports that secure boot is enabled. I think it's a bit small to see the back bit. Uh, the video is online if you want to look at it afterwards. Um, so th what I'm going to try here is uh, modifying the bootloader what the firmware executes and in a way that would not ordinarily cause it to, well it should still boot afterwards but because the signature is different it's going to, well the firmware should refuse to boot it. So. I've just written FOSDEM uh, 2019 to the very first string in the program. Uh, then the VM is then restarted. And if all goes well, the firmware will uh, stop and not boot the operating system. So okay, this is a trivial example, but it kind of shows what you know, if malware tried to somehow patch the kernel. Um, it's not very clear, but that's um, the UEFR way of showing that it didn't boot, <laughs> which is not exactly the greatest user experience, but um, it's possible to then run the command manually or execute the bootloader manually, and you can see it says security violation, which means that uh, secure boot is doing its job. So. Uh, that just leaves, when will it be available? Unfortunately, it's not yet pu been publicly released. Um, so we intend to release it shortly and it'll be announced on the Zen mailing list. So if you're interested, please look out for it there. And um, that's uh, the end of what I've got to say. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, the question was, how does it relate to QMU and how does it work with QMU in stub domain? Um, so, at least as we've implemented it, it's a separate daemon that's completely separate for QMU, from QMU. So Zen has um, support for, they call IREX servers, which, um, and you can have them uh, in separate programs, essentially. So... Um, it's kind of not related at all, and if QMU is in a stub domain, then this daemon could be anywhere else, um, including in a stub domain as well. 
yes. Do you have working code? Uh, yes. So the question was, do I have working code for the certificate and authentication stuff? Uh, the, an uh, the answer is yes. So the demo that I showed was kind of all uh, all working. The talk is not over yet. Please close the door. You will have a time actually to enter the room. Sorry, can you just repeat what you said? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's implemented. Um, so I didn't didn't have a demo of that because it's, I mean, not really much to demo there. But. Uh, you mean the implementing time? Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of a, f a few thousand lines. I don't think it's not super intense to write. Um, we kind of also developed a test, fairly extensive test suite for it because it is quite complicated. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean, that is kind of the disadvantage of this approach is that it has to duplicate some of the code that's already been implemented in OVMF. Uh, but well, I mean, it's not. It's a few thousand lines of C code, so it's not so terrible. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it, it, it maps the memory, but then copies it out of the. It copies it out of the memory that it's mapped before it uses it. Um, so, I don't know what you mean about how how else would it get it if it didn't map the guest memory. Yeah, I don't know. So the problem with with this is that with SMM you have known problems with SMM. Uh, you can use them to bypass it your boot. Yeah. But with this, if you actually find uh, a vulnerability in Vast D, you escape from zero. So the difference is that with SMM, the bugs stay in the guest. Yeah. Here, the bugs go to DOM zero. I agree that it's probably not hard to audit for things that are as trivial as time of check to time of use. Yeah. But still, it, it seems to me that the good design would at least eliminate the possibility of them happening before. Uh, so the question was uh, basically how is <coughs> the question is how d uh, is the security of VastLD handled because it's running in DOM zero so it's kind of an extra attack surface. Um, so at least for um, how we've implemented it on Zen server specifically, it runs kind of sort of with no privileges in a sort of container environment and so even if um, you could escape into DOM zero it should well it should be contained yeah and you can't really escape out of that extra jail kind of thing. Uh, there's Kristen at the back. Uh, can you run the DOM zero bit in the sub domain? Uh, yes that would be uh, so the question was can you run the DOM zero bit in a stub domain um, so that would be the answer is yes. That would be another approach to uh, reducing or well, removing any p potential security risk of running it. Um, so, yeah, either w within a jail or some kind of stub domain. Is, is there one first for D for all VMs, or is there one for every VM? It's a separate <coughs> instance. Uh, is there one for D for every domain? Um, the answer is yes. Um, it's a separate instance, kind of like the way. You you get a separate QMU for each domain. Uh, so time is up. Uh, you can find me uh, afterwards if you want to ask any other questions. Uh, thank you.